G'day everybody and welcome to Pints with Aquinas. I want to give you a heads up about today's episode with an ex-abortionist. We get into some really troubling uh, topics and uh, sometimes it gets a little graphic, not on purpose, but you know, trying to navigate this conversation um, was, a, was a little difficult in that we're talking about a very, very sensitive matter. So I just, if you know, don't have kids around, watch this first. Uh, also, if you or someone you love has had an abortion and this is a very sensitive area for you, you might consider skipping it. I don't think it's hyperbolic <clears throat> to say that there's a really good chance we're going to get flagged on YouTube for this. Again, not because we said anything inappropriate, but in the way that we, and especially my guest, exposed um, the horror of abortion. So do me a favor, please go and follow me on Locals, mattfrad.locals.com. We are also over on Rumble. Now might be a good time to go follow us over there in case we start getting flagged and big tech comes after us. Thanks. Dr. John Brokolsky, it is lovely to have you in the studio. It is wonderful to be here with you, Matt. Did you come down for other reasons or was this uh, the primary one? This was uh, a, a primary as primary can get. Uh, I'm also here uh, for some other issues. So it's, okay. been, it's been a great time. Good. It's good to be here on your feast day too, by the way. Yes, thank you. Yeah, well, thank you for thank you for making the trip. Um, for those of you, for those who are watching who don't know much about you, uh -huh. who are you, real quickly, and then we'll get into your story. A uh, sixty-three-year-old uh, <laughs> doctor of medicine, mm -hmm. an MD degree from uh, the University of South Alabama and the Eastern Virginia College of Medicine. Been practicing OBGYN and medicine for about forty total years. The first six years of my life, I practiced. Um, within the confines of the sexual revolution. And I grew up in a great Catholic family in North Jersey, Jersey strong, mm -hmm. Bible strong, prayerful, Catholic, Marian. And I told them to get lost as I got more and more into the culture. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was only because of data, a witness and the truth, the hound of heaven never kept, uh, never gave up on me. Mm -hmm. And so uh, for the last 34 years of the 40, I've been practicing uh, clinical medicine at Tepeyac OBGYN in Northern Virginia. Okay. And uh, now I'm president of Divine Mercy Care and uh, had a conversion, wrote a book called Two Patients, put out by uh, uh, Ignatius, uh, uh, Ignatius so. Press. Excellent. So in those beginning years, you performed abortions, you were involved in so-called sex change surgeries, yes. everything so, everything in between. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Growing up in a great Catholic family with great parents, I was taught to be the best I could be. And I had to work hard to get, get it. You work at what you deserve. You trust in God, pray as hard as if everything depends on God, and then work as hard as if everything depends on you. Mm-hmm. And when you begin to um, become an OBGYN back in the day, in the 1980s, okay. the sexual revolution was everywhere. Okay. Our profession was pro-abortion, pro-sterilization, pro-contraception. Where I trained, it was the home of the first in vitro baby in the United States, 1981. And uh, we were also the landing spot for the whole sex change team from Hopkins when they came down to Norfolk. Mm. So I, being wanting to be an excellent gynecologist and an obstetrician, mm -hmm. OBGYN, I wanted to deliver babies. But I also wanted to stamp out fertility. Mm. And I wanted to handle infertility by making embryos. Um, and all of those procedures were standard part and parcel of the profession that we've come to know as those who delivered babies wow. in this country. Yeah, God have mercy. OBGYN, God have mercy on us. How did you come to the position where you thought abortion was a fine thing? Because I presume you had to talk yourself into oh, why. Yeah, absolutely. What you, oh, yeah. absolutely. It, was it the culture that evangelized you, quote unquote, into this way of thinking so that it didn't take much convincing or... <laughs> So was there know, a shift of, of oh, opinion? Listen, oh, listen, my mom and dad were tremendous. They consecrated me to Our Lady the Saturday after my birth. Mm. 
in 1960. <laughs> <laughs> Altar boy, Catholic school. But during the late 70s and early 80s, um, Stairway to Heaven <laughs> was a church song oh, taught yeah. by the nuns. Oh, dear Lord. And love was um, a bridge over troubled waters. These are the songs that we listen to in the service. I've been there. Same here, buddy. And uh, when my parents raised us to love the Lord and work hard, they assumed that the culture, as in Poland up until a point, supported the family. <laughs> mm. Our culture doesn't support the family. No, it's in fact, actively working against it. It's actively it. working against yeah. it. And medicine today is actively working against the family. Yeah. So there I was going to high school mm -hmm. and beginning to challenge my parents. Well, they were old Polish people. Dad was, uh, he left the seminary um, just before he got ordained. Um, I was beginning to hear, uh, there's a lot of differences within the Catholic Church. You have to be tolerant and loving. And maybe the church needs to grow up because truth is really relative and there's many ways to God including Buddhism and Hinduism, because we were studying mm -hmm. religious history, not the formation of faith, even though I had faith. But I turned my back on it because I became a man pleaser, a woman pleaser. My friends began to say, oh yeah, this uh, fertility stuff, it's the chains of my fertility, John. Mm. Please help me get rid of it contraception, sterilization, sex outside of marriage. This is the late 70s. And is it, it, you in high school still or a doctor at this high, point? No, no, no. This is high school and yeah. then college. Yeah. Went to a Jesuit college in Mobile, Alabama. And uh, we learned situational ethics. We had a position paper put out the day that John Paul II was raised mm. to the seat of Peter as he was a limited European anti-communist narrow-minded and it was only a lutheran philosopher who taught me phenomenology mm -hmm. that said this guy's going to be called the great someday mm. but now the conflict's beginning right that split and that's how i did it i just slowly seeped away so yeah. then once i get into medical school and they know I have a knack for PMS, premenstrual syndrome in women. I have a knack for menopause. I, could, I can listen. My female friends have taught me how to be a great OBGYN. For 30 years, people have come into Northern Virginia because I'm a good diagnostician. I take them seriously. They're integrated whole human beings. <clears throat> They're body, soul, and spirit. Mm -hmm. So it's not just fixing a car it's building a relationship that you can go deeper and when the sins arise the medicine cooperates the sacramental medicine mm -hmm. cooperates with the sacrament and all of a sudden you can help people grow in health holiness and wholeness mm -hmm. however back in the day i believed we needed to control mother nature we need to control your hormones. So we'll shut off your brain with a pill. We'll inject your arm with a plug of hormones. Or we'll stick a plastic or a copper into your uterus like the old camels back in the day where they stuck coconuts inside their uteruses to make them not get pregnant mm. on the spice trails. This is what we do in OBGYN. This is what I was taught. And I believed it, and I believed that would bring happiness and wholeness. So let's get to the abortion that you asked. Well, I wanted to ask sure. first, were there certain things that you were more comfortable doing than others? In other words, I could see somebody mm -hmm. saying, okay, I'm, I understand why maybe contraception could be needed in certain circumstances, but not abortion. Yes. I, was that a difficult bridge to... It, it wasn't difficult because it was a seamless conversation at the educational level see, and yeah. at the mentoring level. Yeah. Because now they're over you, the mentors, 
the attendings, the famous people who write the articles, who publish in our journals. And they are 100% wanting to stamp out fertility, which includes abortion. Because remember, life no longer begins at fertilization. In 1973, the definition changed. Mm. It begins at implantation mm -hmm. or whenever the mother says it does. <laughs> now, if you're not brought up with a firm, clear formation in the faith, my dad assumed that, that that's what I was learning. No. It wasn't until year, years later when he sent me Austin Fagathy's Right and Reason, I didn't learn any of this. <laughs> no. Summa? What? Are you kidding me? No, we don't, we don't, we don't do that. Mm -hmm. I learned everything but all the dissenters, <laughs> mm. all the people who were making headlines in the 60s and 70s, the cutting edge of theology at the time. And so with definitions changing and the power structure such that, well, if you want to get a good grade and get a good job and you want to be the best at you, what you want to be, you have to do this. So yes, the contraception piece was easy to buy into, but they teach you to do terminations, abortions, um, with very early pregnancies. That's how they, be correct. That's how you begin. Yeah. Correct. Okay. Now. Today's day and age, they don't do that. They, they, they try to work on papayas and fruits, and they try to do it, you know, virtually. When you do an early abortion, say less than five or six, say six weeks, seven weeks, the little one has no bones yet. The calcium hasn't deposited. So when you remove... And once again, anybody who's listening to us today, Matt, I pray blessing and peace and mercy in the name of Jesus Christ through the intercession of St. Thomas. Mm -hmm. Because this, this revolution affects all of us. Right. Either we were a part of it or it affected our families or people close yeah. to us. Yeah. And I know because I'm post-abortal, so I want to identify with your audience. Yeah. It's okay. Hold my hand. Listen to what Matt's, but listen to what Matt does. Yeah. And walk. Yeah, we are all in one way or another the victims of a sexual revolution, and and I'm no different. I mean, I was fornicating as a teenager. I once said to my girlfriend, "If you got pregnant, you just get an abortion," because she Correct. was worried that she'd be pregnant and presumably I would have, if, it, if she had been pregnant, I would have went through with that. God have mercy on me, a sinner. You know, we're indoctrinated from the beginning by right. MTV and all sorts of bullshit. Absol absolutely. absolutely. And so, yeah, we, I guess, I don't want to speak for you, but I'm sure you would agree <laughs> with me that if, if you're a woman watching who's had an abortion, if you're a man who's taken a woman to get an abortion, if you're a doctor who's been performing abortions, these are very evil, wicked, despicable, despicable things but god's mercy is bigger than your wretchedness and right and you're you're welcome here to listen to this yeah. absolutely and you know at our practice people come in and eventually they feel the relationship develop and then they can talk about mm. the dark parts of their heart you know i am uh, with all due respect matt uh the shit in my life has been such that and my own nuances Aquinas has the capacity to help people think through things, mm -hmm. but I'm kind of the, um, the, the opening act, <laughs> so to speak. I help inspire, build relationships with people to get them to the point where they can look inside and admit these <sighs> things. So then I can pass them along yeah. to those around me, like yourself, like many others, mm -hmm. good priests, good professors, good friends, so they can truly be healed because there is hope and healing yeah. after this. That's the yeah. most, because that's my story. I'm the poster child yes, for this. Yes. So if you're watching now and you're like, oh, this is going to be difficult to swallow. We're, we're getting there. We're going to get to the, yeah. going to get to the healing. Yes. Was your, the first abortion you performed, all these euphemisms are so offensive, aren't they? Termination, abortion, it's Perform. killing, it's slaughtering the unborn. But Correct. The first time you slaughtered an unborn child. Was that a was that a watershed moment for you? Did you not feel anything? Mm, well, can you imagine, Taj, my dad, 
Polish for Thaddeus, Todge took his high school civics class to the March for Life every year. Hmm. I grew up with that. Mm -hmm. So it was a big deal, except that when you put your friends in front of above your father and mother, it becomes less of a big deal. Yeah. But still, remember, the body doesn't lie. <laughs> mm. So the adrenal kicks in and the thyroid begins to ramp up and your eyes become pinpoint and your heart rate begins to raise. And then you sit down and the woman is awake and you're just doing it under local anesthesia because it's cheaper. And she doesn't want it. The hospital doesn't want it. You don't want it. So you get rid of it. Well, it's the abortion. It's the murder. It's the slaughter, right? Well, you dilate the cervix and you gently slide in um, a straw that has a lot of suction on it. And you put it to the top and you begin to turn it on and you twirl it a few times and out rushes uh, tissue, blood, but looks like blood clot because there's no bones. There's no parts yet. So what you steeled yourself for ain't there. And you do a few of those. Mm -hmm. And each time a bit of your heart hardens slowly, but surely. Well, it's not that bad. John, John, um, there's somebody here who's 10 weeks now. Um, we have to count parts afterwards. So just do a thorough job. Oh, okay. Well, I've already done a few. Mm. Once again, now she's under anesthesia because she asked for it. She paid for it. And you do the same thing. You gently dilate the cervix, or maybe you don't do it gently because you've got to get something now the size of a thumb inside an area that is the, maybe the diameter of a, pe a pencil mm. lead. Mm. You do that over a few seconds or minutes, damaging the cervix documented by our data. And you put in bigger suction, a bigger straw in. Mm. And you pass, you twist it a few times to get out as much as you can. And then you reach in with a pair of long, slender pliers. Find the top of the uterus because you're still a good surgeon. You're trying to be the best you can be. You don't want to hurt the woman. Right. Got and you just start pulling out whatever's left. Mm -hmm. But you're doing it rapidly and quickly because you, right by now, the placenta is bleeding, the, f the fetus, the child is bleeding, but it's only this big, it's an inch big. But you have to then, once everything finishes and you think you've finished the procedure, you turn, you face the table and you empty out the sack, the cloth sack, where everything got collected, and you just have to count parts. Mm. And you come face to face with what you did, but up till now, you've been encouraged, supported, told, congratulated, discipled, I'm congratulated. Sure. Every single social mechanism, every single psychological mechanism is now helping you because deep down inside, in the human heart, we are angels and we are saints. It's our heart. <laughs> mm. And that division, that brokenness runs right through the human heart. I mm. think Solzhenitsyn said that. Good and evil, right in the same person. Choice. Freedom. Those are words that really mattered in this work I was doing. But the definitions had flipped. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well... Uh, okay, there's, uh, there's a, a rib cage, uh, kind of a skull that's crushed. Okay, I think we got it all. Mm. And then there's a twinge, but immediately, because remember, when you ask a woman about, was the, what, was the abortion good for her? All the exit interviews, the immediate exit, oh yes, absolutely. Right. She may be crying her brains out, her heart out, but squeeze her hand. It's okay, you did the best. This is right for you whispers I'm here with you the nurses good job you did it we're good you're good you can get back on with your life slowly but surely that love 
that's inside of us becomes hard. Mm. And I contend, <laughs> which we can talk about at some point in this conversation, the reason why more doctors don't do abortions is because it's brutal. It's actually physical violence. Try it. <laughs> they can't. They try. And I would say 85 to 90% of those who try it don't continue with it. It's easy to stay in their ideology. Yeah. It's easy to stay in the language that keeps a distance. Oh, it's a fetus. Oh, it's unwanted. <laughs> oh, it's necessary. Oh, it's health care now. And my American college says it should be legal until birth. Birth. Now that's after birth. No, we shouldn't get involved if there's a live product of an abortion. This mm. is where we're at now. Yeah, explain what that, I know what you mean, but explain what that means for people. So. Not to get involved. No, no, yeah. it's okay. The American, so one of, you know, one of my, one of my abortions, the one that actually made a difference where the Lord entered my world again in a way I could, I could be open to it was a live baby being delivered mm. after an abortion that was crying in the bucket that I caught it in. How did you try to kill it at, at that age, at that stage? So such that it could that live? evening I covered it with a towel so it wouldn't cry, so the mother would not hear it cry. Oh. However, being a good doctor, it was moving. It was moving. Was the mother unconscious? No, no. The mother was there, but she, this woman, when I said, you're in early labor, she goes, I really don't want it. Get uh, rid of it. Uh, I can't handle this for all the reasons we know. Yeah. Partners gone, no support from home, yep. poor, you know, okay. Yeah, bless Break her. water, give her Pitocin, blow out the baby. Yeah. So you caught it in a bucket. I caught it in a bucket. It was squeaking and making noise. It was 23 weeks. It had to be close to mm. what I thought was a pound. In the state of Virginia, 500 grams is a little bit more than a pound. That's when you have to call the nursery. Mm. Now, once again, in my story, in the very next room, I was saving a baby at the same age, but the mother wanted the child. Now, did she go in for an abortion and it survived? No, no it was no. just, a, it's in the same it's, floor. It, People it's are this, killing. And... It's labor and delivery okay. in a big university hospital. Ooh. One woman comes in in early labor. The other woman just finds out she's pregnant and comes in labor. I see. When you look at both, you treat both. You treat the disease, never the desire. That's what I've learned now as part mm -hmm. of my awakening to excellent medicine. And so in one room, she wanted it. So we used every medicine, every trick I could, and I'm whispering, it's okay, you can do this. It's okay, put up, put up with this medicine. It's gonna, it's gonna make you feel hot for a while. We can do this. It's, it, look, it's slowing down. It, it's slowing down. We're gonna be able to keep this baby inside of you, I believe. Hang in there, Janie, hang in there. And then you dash and over. Then, and then you walk, <laughs> maybe a wall this thick, <laughs> to another room, and the woman's like, shit, get it out of me. I can't do this. I just found out I'm pregnant. Look at the, well, psychologically, this wasn't her first. She was in a bad relationship. I'm yeah. sure as her belly grew, because remember, these babes are above the umbilical, they're above the belly button. That's how big they are. Well, when I reached in around my towel, trying to suffocate this child, I picked it up by its head and it felt heavy. So I put it, on the scales, and that's when it showed 505 grams. So you didn't just, forgive me, you didn't just let it die, you tried actively to suffocate it at that point, which is no different to killing it within the womb, of course, so no. I suppose it shouldn't shock me, but Look it does. Me. No, this is the whole idea. When they say, when, when the world says, when a live product of an abortion, product, they're talking- mother they're, effers. They are truly MFers. Buddy, I know because it's inside of you. The whole system is rigged to abort the pregnancy, get to decrease fertility. Climate change, too many people, human cause. 
we are always the problem. The human person is always where, wait a second. Where's the, where's the definition? So remember with Roe, we had abortion first trimester, always legal. Second trimester, states could regulate. And in third trimester, uh, it was a gray zone. Some people said no, some places said yes. So you had late term abortions. Mm. Now after with Dobbs, it's all back to the states. Well, there are certain states like California, New York, that will say, no, abortion up to birth. But they don't say it that way. They just say, you have to have the right to an abortion because of mother, health of the mother reasons. But what they're talking about with a failed abortion is what? A live baby struggling to survive. Because that's what humans do. They're built in, mm -hmm. in their nature, with survival. Now it's your job to either... Yeah, I this wanna, is, this what's, what's the specific thing you're being taught to do in that instance? End the life. Put it away. Because without support... Remember, these abortions are done very close to and past viability. Back... You know, I'm 63, buddy. When I started, we could save babies at around 26 to 27 weeks. It quickly went to 25 and now in 2023, mm. it's now down to 22.5 to 23 weeks. We now have better science. Remember, all throughout the abortion period of Roe, science has improved. We now do fetal surgery. <laughs> we now treat diseases of the mother better. We have better therapies for f children born who in utero showed us they had illnesses. So as science has improved, so has our ability to care for mom and child. We never pit mother against child. But when that child's crying in your bucket and she wanted an abortion, it is adding more pain to the mother. That's why we suffocate the child. Oh my gosh. Because we see it as misplaced mercy. And I can tell you yeah. that it's not always, you know, once you lose, once you lose the moorings for language and logic, yeah, yeah. once you lose those moorings, yeah, the abuse of language, abuse of power, you just make them a fetus yeah. and you do what you got to do. It's an unseemly business, but someone must do it yep. because women yeah. are suffering. Now, again, so when, <laughs> when, when people are directing you on this, I mean, there's got to be procedures in place. So when the baby's born alive and you said, put it away, like, tell me what that means. Well, once again, well, once again, this is, this is 1987 mm -hmm. and 1988 and 19, early 1989. We've come a long way since then, sadly. Yeah. Now, most of our late-term abortionists will use potassium chloride I see. to in intracardiac, in, inside the heart, stop oh. the heart with high-dose potassium. Yeah. So it doesn't come out alive. Right. So there's no monitors. So there's right. no... But in the 80s. But in the 80s, this was uh, Wild West. Remember, we were building embryos. We were, uh, we were doing IVF. It was all research. So other than suffocating it, how else would, quote-unquote, doctors... You would... Put it in the can, and you would take it and put it in the dirty oh. laundry. Because under 500 grams, the pathologist does not treat the tissue, the fetus. And once again, your response is the proper response, but it has all been dumbed down. Yeah. It's so common to see violence yeah. on our TV screens and on our notepads and on our iPads. It's so common to hear mercy killing rather than divine mercy that is salvational. <laughs> Every word has been bastardized. Yeah. And we're now morphing. What's a woman? I don't know. Mm. It has come to its logical conclusion. No more science, no more genetics, no more embryology. It's whatever the heck you think it is mm -hmm. based on your definition of sentience 
or consciousness. And yet in that moment, I, somebody who has been touched, great family, and then know the love of Jesus Christ. I look back on that person and that was me. That is me. And so Romans 8, 28, all things work to the good to those who are called according to his purpose. Mm. Dude, that ain't a punchline. <laughs> he uses everything oh. in our past. Amen. For me, this is my life. And so I don't throw stones at people yeah. because I fully understand that not only is it horrific and immolating, total destruction at any cost, for any mm. reason, at any time. There are walking people out there who are still struggling with these wounds. This darling woman may be watching. Yes, absolutely. And that's why my whole life, when you, you know, I'm sure we'll talk, but when Christ touches you or the mother mm. helps you touch him, helps you, You see your life pass before you and you can't go back. Yeah. But you feel graced and mercy mm -hmm. forgiven. Mm -hmm. Take us back to that night where you're performing both an abortion, suffocating a baby in a bucket, as well as trying to save. So what to just, yeah, I mean, you've shared a little bit, but what did that do no, to you? No, sure. What happened after that? So, um, imagine <laughs> the lead up to this is that, oh, by the way, I'm volunteering at a pregnancy center once every two weeks at night. A pregnancy center, mm -hmm. pregnancy resource center. It's down in Witch Duck Road in Virginia Beach. That's where it was run by a basically the Assembly of God Church. Mm -hmm. Hold hands, dear Jesus, whoever comes in tonight, we just pray that we can help them see that the life inside them is truly God. one of theirs and that the Lord may take them. them and save them and praise the Lord for this and we're <clears> going <throat> to do our best. I loved it, but I was a worm. I didn't tell them that I, yes, I told them I was an OBGYN. They were thrilled. I didn't tell them I was aborting children as part of my residency. I didn't tell them that I thought children were sexually transmitted diseases. I was a worm. Why did you go? Because I saw a pregnancy center, pregnancy help center. And remember, I was just as good at helping keep babies than ending the life of the child, the fetus, mm. both and. Yeah, depending on what she and, wants. Correct. Because I was serving what the world said is true. Life begins at the mother's desire and the health of the fetus. If the fetus is sick, oh no, eugenically, we get rid of all that. Because I was doing those too. Now, I'm up at the pregnancy center. I'm going to the Assembly of God Church once, and I'm like, wow, this is interesting. They believe in the power of the Holy Spirit, good music, you know, this is interesting. I go back, and uh, that night when that baby comes out, and I you know, thought about ending its life. So it didn't make paperwork. So it mm. didn't, you know, this is common today. I had to, once the baby was over 500 grams, I had to hit the button on the wall and bring in the intensive care nursery. We call it the NICU, neonatal, around the time of birth, intensive care unit, mm -hmm. NICU. In walks Dr. Debbie Plum, brilliant, sharp, demanding, and Catholic. She comes in and goes, she quickly assesses and goes, she knew what I did. Hey, stop treating my patients as tumors. The witness statement. <laughs> Middle of the night, stop treating my patients as tumors. And oh, by the way, have coffee with me tomorrow. And then she went and took care of the child, intubated, meaning... This is the one you were trying to suffocate, or yeah. began to, yeah. yeah. Okay. This, is, this, is, this is the aborted, this is the failed abortion. Okay. The child who survived my attempt 
at ending the pregnancy and yeah. ending its life. Okay, all right. They come in, they call their people, they bring the little incubator in, the intubation occurs, all the people are working on this little child, 505 grams, 450 grams is a pound, pound and two ounces maybe, translucent skin, no hair, moving its arms, trying to squeak. She walks out of the room with her team and that child goes into the nursery to be resuscitated. After I didn't monitor it, I treated it as a tumor. And that's what got me. I want to tell so you about a course that I have created for men to overcome pornography. It is called strive21.com slash Matt. You go there right now, or if you text strive to 66866, we'll send you the link. It's 100% free. And it's a course I've created to help men, to give them the tools to overcome pornography. Usually men know that porn is wrong. They don't need me or you to convince them that it's wrong. What they need is a battle plan to get out. And so I've distilled all that I've learned over the last 15 or so years as I've been talking and writing on this topic into this one course. Think of it as if you and I could have a coffee over the next 21 days and I would kind of guide you along this journey. That's basically what this is. It's incredibly well produced. Uh, we had a whole camera crew come and film this. Um, and I think it'll be a really a real help to you. And it's also not an isolated course that you go through on your own because literally tens of thousands of men have now gone through this course. And as you go through the different videos, there's comments from men all around the world encouraging each other, offering to be each other's accountability partners and things like that. Strive21, that's strive21.com slash Matt, or as I say, text, text strive to 66866 to get started today. You won't regret it. So here I am. Now I have to have coffee with this person tomorrow morning. I go find her. Should we have coffee? She goes, hey, John, you're excellent, man. In your clinic, you make house calls. In your clinic, they wait in line for you. In your clinic, you listen to your patients. In your clinic, and we hear it. We hear about, we hear about this. What the hell are you doing? What, why did you induce that woman? She didn't want it. John. So your definition of life is based on someone else? Hasn't history shown us that that's like not a real healthy thing to do? <laughs> oh, by the way, I know I'm Catholic and I think you used to be, I know you didn't talk about it much, but um, you need to go to Medjugorje. I just got back with Steubenville University <laughs> and uh, it changed my life and it mm. really made a difference in my life. You need to go, ah, I'm not sure I do that anymore, <laughs> uh, Debbie, uh, but I'll take it. now. In reality, I'm fracturing. They tell me that abortion is safe. Mm -hmm. And yet the data is coming in, abortion and breast cancer, abortion and preterm birth, abortion and mental illness, mm. abortion and damaged cervixes. The data is coming in. Uh, no, but I thought it was safe. Many people go, I would never do an abortion. In fact, the vast majority of people are ambivalent or life affirming in the sense of maybe in special cases. Mm -hmm. I realized there's a whole subset of a world out there that really believed like my parents did because I had to go back to them and go buzz off. Did they know you were performing abortions? Yes. Yes. Because that's what you do when you want to get past the ideology. You want to mm -hmm. embrace it. Yeah. And then you have to do things. And then it's yeah. And then it's not enough that others tolerate your sin. They have to celebrate it, they, or they're a threat. Correct. That's why this video will be a threat. That's why I'm not. Wouldn't be surprised if we get demonetized from YouTube after this. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Let it be. We're a threat. You don't. You don't know how much I really appreciate being with you here, with. Um, the saints that the, the cloud of witnesses that surround us here. I, I, I believe with all my heart that this woman challenged me. She was the witness added to the data, added to some of my friends going, you know, I'm having a hard time killing a down syndrome hmm. fetus. Really? Hmm. Yeah. Back uh, Thanksgiving, uh, my cousin, Mike, who had down syndrome asked me if he was an endangered species. And I said nothing. 
because I'm a weasel and I'm a worm. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy for I'm a sinner. Mm. And yet I am redeemed. So two days later, my mom gets on the phone and goes, Hey, John, do you want to go to Dubrovnik with me for a winter break? I like Dubrovnik. Oh yeah. Yeah. On the Adriatic. I love it. She's like, um, yeah, but we're going to go to a place called Medjugorje for no a few way. days. Would you mind? Yeah, way. This is and the she, second time you've heard that name, probably. Medjugorje. Second time. Yeah. Because my father basically was like, no, no, that's not approved. We can't go yeah, there. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, lo and behold, I go, sure, mom. Because when moms ask, you go. And it must have. Did it feel providential that you're hearing this word no. a few days after your no. doctor? Yeah, no. it was. Well. You know how some people say there's no such thing as coincidences or God incidences? Yeah. Coincidence. You yeah, know, yeah, yeah. Come on. I'm science. Yeah. Uh, by this point, you know, I'm a, you know, I'm a, uh, I believe in scientism. Mm -hmm. I believe that there's nothing out there where it's all chance. Yeah. Roll the dice, you know, uh, the pool of sludge that created the protein that, cre you know, mm -hmm. that's how genes, you know, blah, blah, blah. Anyway. So, uh, Two weeks later, a week later, 10 days later, whatever it was, I went. And uh, my mom, uh, you know, it's a 10-hour flight. You know, we flew into, I think, Dubrovnik. It was gorgeous. And I brought my Bible because they give you a Bible at the <laughs> Assembly of God Church. And um, I had a um, book about the place written by a Lutheran who was very amenable to it. And I'm like, damn, I am not going to go to any freaking visionaries. I'm not going to, I don't. And uh, I was there with my mother. It was uh, January. Honestly, Medjugorje is worth going to just for the coffee, to be fair. God. It's terrific, isn't it? It was. <laughs> just... Yes, it is. I love the coffee. Yeah. It's a little Turkish, a little Italian. It's yeah. got that flavor, robust. Any... <laughs> oh, boy. Um and uh, while we were there, we get off the bus and we went, oh, by the way, with a communist travel agency. Mom just called up CHIT, C-I-T, which was communist run. Oh. Their hotel wasn't, of course, didn't work. So we <laughs> stayed at a home with people who were there. So it defaulted to a home. Yeah. And here was this family with a little child. The mother had her second child. We were up in the loft. There were four Americans. There were probably 15 Belgian people praying for pro-life work. Mm. There were probably 20 Italians and the rest were just town people. 1989, winter, cold. And, uh, you know, mom and I get off the bus and immediately there's things in the sky that my mother saw that she felt unworthy to see. Sun spinning, mm. becoming a Eucharist, uh, heart beating, <laughs> A heart beating in the sun. You can hear the noise. She's I, seeing this. She's seeing it. I saw some of it, but I said, uh, this is um, mass psychosis. Because remember, you know, Jesus, you know, you see Jesus and you still turn away from yeah. him. Yeah. So, uh, we begin to walk around the town and uh, eventually um, I end up going to the small apparition hill called Pudbro, and um, while I was sitting there, um, a young woman comes up to me, um, who I believe was Belgian. And once again, this is stuff that I, you know, I share with people, and uh, it's in the book to patients, but you know, I, I don't, it's just prayer. I mean, it's not something for me to think, you know, to contemplate over, because it's just part of my life. And uh, she comes up and she says, oh, you're, you're the mother's doctor. Mother who? What are you talking about? Well, I was praying over there, and I think you're an OBGYN, and I have a bunch of things to tell you. Would you sit down and open up your... Who's saying this to you? A woman from Belgium. You never met? Never met. And after several tens, maybe over 60, things that she said would happen, or possibly could happen if I opened my heart here because my heart was hard and she knew that she says it was hard as the rocks on the ground i said yeah you're nuts you know thanks <laughs> but hmm i put down my book 
began to open up my Bible, and um, there, <laughs> then we had uh, singing of some sort in my prayer, in my prayer, and uh, a smell of roses. And uh, when I looked up uh, there in front of me in my prayer yeah. was the, the sacred and immaculate hearts. You've said in my prayer. I haven't heard that expression before. What do you mean? <laughs> I'm praying. <laughs> I'm just praying my heart out here that if there is a God, that he would hear me. I'm praying that my mother is here. Now I'm fracturing. I know I'm fracturing. I know I'm fracturing. But it's not because of what I'm doing. It's because of the lies that my parents told me are still inside of me, see, pulling yeah. me back. Yeah. But I'm fracturing. Because I count body parts. And by this point, I was doing bigger abortions with tearing off limbs. And uh, mm. I was building, I was helping remove eggs for embryos to make embryos for IVF in vitro fertilization. And I was sterilizing anything that was poor. Anything, I know what you mean, but say. I know. Well, anybody who couldn't afford more children, uh, we made sure that um, their tubes were tied. Without their consent. Well, with their consent, but with, you know, we just encouraged them and we gave them all the positives without the negatives. And, you know, and, and it wasn't until, you know, after my change of heart, some of those people tried to come back to me two years later mm. after being with them and praying for them. You know, they're back at church. They now have found a man. They now have found somebody that they could give their life to. And oh, by the way, I tied their tubes two or three years mm -hmm. earlier. And now they wanted children and family. Couldn't do it because, you know, the state, federal government doesn't pay for that. Tough place to be. So it sounds like in Medjugorje, you were in the same position as Peter when he said, get away from me, I'm a sinful man. So, <laughs> so once again, in my prayer, when I looked up and I saw or imagined what I saw, I fell flat down on the ground and said, I am a man of unclean lips in a land of unclean lips. Get away from me. And I hit the ground as hard as I could, yet I didn't get hurt. It's all rock. And then in my prayer, she just gently lifted me up through my arm and she put my right arm into his side where I touched the heart of Christ, the font of mercy mm. in my prayer. And um, everything had changed. I collapsed to my knees. I'm still, now I'm seeing myself as a leper and my skin is just rotten and it's beginning to be healed. And scales come off my eyes and I look up or I, and I'm loved, beloved. Totally loved. I saw my life pass before me, sins of omission and commission. I was deeply sorry. There was fear, but not. There was, um, Father, forgive me for I'm a sinner. Right through me right through me. And then she picked me back up again. The mother, you know, in my prayer said, uh, do you want to help my son renew the face of the earth in medicine? And I said, oh my God, is that the answer to my schizophrenia? Is that the, is that the answer to my split? Fusion with the father brings joy to the sinner's heart. The fusion. The fusion that the mother is expert at. Mm. The fusion that Aquinas and the rest of the cloud of witnesses 
have witnessed. It's the beginning of the reality of the converge of the consecration to Our Lady that the mother that my mother did for me back mm. seven days after my birth. But I'm now learning that consecration is really Holocaust, which nobody likes to talk about. But <laughs> it's okay. I'll walk with you through it. Do you want to help renew the face of the earth in medicine? How? How? Be excellent. See the underserved next to the served. Follow the teachings of my son's church in medicine and faith and reason. And oh, by the way, when you finish here, go show yourself to my priest mm -hmm. down at the bottom of the hill and go to confession. <laughs> First time in 15 years, whatever. I don't know, 10 years. So, Matt, Glory to God. this what was, was it, yeah. What and, was that experience like going huh, to confession? <laughs> so, one of the pillars of this place called Medjugorje is forgiveness, repentance. Mm -hmm. Repent and believe. Repent and live the virtues. Like, repent. Use the Eucharist. Mm. The mother, as someone wiser than me once said, the mother is the milk to our bread. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. St. Augustine. She, yes. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, um, I went and I'm stumbling, you know, so now I've gotten this book, this you know, woman, my mother's not with me. She's too tired. She's back oh. on the, she's back in the <laughs> pension in, yeah. up in the attic. She's got the electric heater going. And uh, I walk down, I walk across the field, and it's a, believe it or not, a sheep path, <laughs> lamb. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and there in this dirt, oh, I don't know, half a football field, there's a priest sitting on a wicker, ch um, a folding chair mm -hmm. with a chair facing him. <laughs> Nobody in line. I walk up, I say, um, do you speak English? Yes. Is this confession? Yes. You might have to help me. It's been a while. And when I sat down, it was like um, the Polish sweat in me, the tears, the visceral, yeah. you know, that Hebrew heart, that Polish heart that is heart, gut, and womb. Unloaded. The depth of of our heart, my heart. Because up on that hill, I saw that the Catholic Church is merciful, that the Eucharist is the body and blood, soul and divinity of Jesus Christ. The sacraments are the stepping stones to life. They're not hindrances. Mm -hmm. Everything that my parents had talked about was healed. No more shame. Mm. No more. And I began, bless me, Father, I think I've sinned, I don't know, decade, decade and a half, I don't know. I'm sorry, I don't, you know, no, no, no keep going. And then the first, the first sin was uh, last week, I uh, dismembered a two-pound infant. So, it went on from there, but the tears... And then I wanted to confess, like, I, I, I just wanted to empty myself. <clears throat> I wanted to run and jump into his lap, Christ's lap. Mm. It was real. And I got up from that, after, you know, after we talked for a bit. And I staggered back to my place of residence and I walked up the steps. So it was really my mother's intercessory prayer, I believe, that uh, really enabled me to receive grace mm. in such a way or seek grace, even though I had no idea in my moanings and in my s splitting, in my division, yeah. my cognitive dissonance. Um, it really was my mom. And, uh, you know, I understand that I'm baptized. And I was given, uh, you know, given everything, a part of the family now. 
but this consecration to Our Lady uh, that my parents gave, but then I followed up with in my own Marian walk, mm. uh, is just abundance. It's mm. just the good Lord showering, building on baptism. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so I found it to be very, very part, much a part of this change of heart that I had. You know, two years earlier between medical school and residency, a friend of mine took me to uh, Guadalupe. Mm -hmm. Cause you know, our house, Our Lady of Chestahova, Fatima, mm -hmm, Lourdes, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, every one of them, you know, these are La Salette, and this is all part of our growth. Mm -hmm. And uh, I went to Guadalupe, saw the image, and while I was there, once again, an internal heart said, why are you hurting me? Is this before Medjugorje? This, yeah, this is yeah. before medical school. Oh. And I remember going, ah, it's the beer I had for lunch. Yeah. You know, let it go. There's nothing here except a pious... Yeah you know, story that you can't prove. Yeah. Old, old women hoping old there's women something to look forward to after their miserable little lives. After their miserable little lives. And, you know, these are all poor people. These are not the academics. These are not the sophisticated. So when you came back from Medjugorje, what, did, yeah. how, how, huh. what happened with your job? Oh, what, listen, what yeah, you... yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I'm flying home and I'm going, uh, well, how am, what am I going to do? <laughs> I have to talk to people now. And, I'm going to just go straight into her office and uh, you know, that first day, uh, I think I had a day off but as, you know, just to rest up from the time change and walked into Dr. Georgiana Jones's office. She was part of the Jones team that came from Harvard to help prov give the United States their first in vitro fertilization program. Even though she was Catholic, she was supportive she was, of this. Well, she wasn't, she was Anglican. She was oh, an I Episcopalian. See. She was the head of our OBGYN oh, department. Okay, okay. It wasn't the NICU doctor. Gotcha, gotcha. And so, uh, lo and behold, I walk into her office and I sit down and I say, uh, uh, hi, Dr. Georgina, I just got back from overseas and um, I've come to the realization that I can no longer perform abortions on women who have no issues except inconvenience or sick children in obstetrics. And, you know, this is back in 89. She just goes, oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. You found Jesus. <laughs> I said, yeah, I did. Now, back then, they weren't forcing you to do abortions. They were encouraging it. It was, you know, it was part of your training if you desired it. But you were still allowed to have a... They could not argue because they themselves were religious. She just said, listen, do what you have to do, but don't tell people about it. Don't go spreading this. And I just sat there and that was it. It was so uncomfortable for her that she just let me go. She didn't challenge me. She says, really? You're so good at what you're so... And I told her, I said, you know, I now see embryos as children. Mm. Like they're not just property. <laughs> they're not like her husband had coined the term pre-embryo almost at that same time. Not quite like an appendix, but not quite like in a baby born. Something in between. A new category mm. of science. New language. A yeah. new, brave new language, right? Yeah. And it never really caught on because it was so foreign. <laughs> Yeah. And it, lo and behold, in my life, um, the big IVF case in this country, in the United States, occurred uh, in Tennessee, at Marysville, Tennessee, when our embryos were trapped between a divorcing husband and husband and wife. The wife wanted them as children to be kept. The husband said, get rid of them. Those were our embryos. And do you know who testified against Dr. Jones was Dr. Jerome Lejeune, the founder of Down syndrome, the venerable on his way, hopefully to sainthood, mm. the Parisian geneticist who cared for with his whole heart, children with 
genetic disorders, but mostly he's the father of finding out the cause of Down syndrome. Mm. God weaves, God is a funny dude. He just weaves a story. And, um, you know, we, I beg him to use whatever garbage I've provided for his glory, turn it into something good. So what have you sought to do so, since that time other than sharing well, no, your story? No, no, which no, is no. So, so yeah. So I come out of the room. There's a few medical students, not Catholics, but from other denominations going, hey, we always knew you'd come around. Hey, let's go get a pizza. And they celebrated this change of heart. How did they know? have no idea. They, went, mm. they, they, they were in a prayer meeting. They were in a prayer group, a <laughs> disciple sure. group <laughs> okay. at, at the school. And uh, so um, instantly I started giving talks to raise money for pregnancy centers. Mm. I began to work more at the local pregnancy center. And then I gave a talk at William and Mary, which was right across the Chesapeake mouth at the time. And there was a student in the audience throwing me softball questions on pro-life issues. His dad was a Catholic pro-life doctor in the Washington DC area who was retired from his practice. And he was hoping to get me to join his old practice because I began to worry once you stop doing what the culture demands of you instantly, I learned natural back then it was called natural family planning. Mm -hmm. It's now fertility awareness mm -hmm. because now I had the tools to understand the woman's language of her body, mm -hmm. the hormonal language of the cycle. Mm -hmm. When it begins, when it ends, menopause, there's a language of the body that's been written into the human heart and into the human body, into the ovaries, mm -hmm. into the whole system. And so I learned from friends calling people up, learning, because this was back in 89. There were very few fully Catholic medical practices. Tom Hilger's mm -hmm. and the Pope Paul VI Institute was just beginning. And he said, oh, come, come here. We'll, we'll teach you. Well, I, I wasn't a scientist. I was more of a clinician. So I went and practiced medicine. Two years of working in this other practice in Maryland. We were not seeing the underserved. Uh, there was a non, you know, we were doing not fully. There were some sterilizations still, but it was considered a pro-life practice because there was no abortions. Mm. And lo and behold, Matt, my wife goes, you know, we can't keep doing this. The mother asked you to do something and you need to do it. The Instant, mother being the blessed the mother. The mother, blessed yeah. mother. And lo and behold, uh, I told him I, I had to give in my 90 days. Mm. I needed to start something. Uh, found a gentleman who was fairly wealthy. $60,000 I thought would start a medical practice back then. He backed out after I quit my job. Oh. And we were down to a few hundred dollars in our checking account. And that's when in our diocese of Arlington, there's no Catholic hospital. We were one of three dioceses in the United States that did not have a Catholic hospital, but we had a great bishop. And we had lots and lots of priests and they came out of the woodwork to support me. I've learned subsequently that when doctors and priests get together, mm. pandemics can be faced medically at the body and at mm -hmm. the soul and at the spiritual level. Anyway, um, my wife and I opened Tepiac family center out of our basement, uh, in February of 19, 94. Um, we saw patients in our home. Um, we partnered with all the pregnancy centers in the area. Send them to us. We'll figure out a way to care for them. We practiced excellent, cooperative, collaborative, fully Catholic medicine. And I learned from those who went before me and, you know, by that point, you start getting talks with Janet Smith and Monsignor William Smith and some of the greats, you know, some of these people who are just, you know, heroes today. Mm -hmm. And uh, because there were so few of us. But then all of a sudden, doctors in our area kept asking, hey, Johnny, how did you do this? <laughs> and then you share with them and then they begin to leave their past. Mm. And then people came from all over because they wanted this medicine. 
when I went and applied to the hospital, the guy said, you're going to be out of business in six weeks. Nobody wants this. No contraception, no sterilization. What are you talking about? But I, you know, go for it. You're a real good surgeon. You have great street, you know, you have great credentials from Holy Cross Hospital in Maryland, the two years that I practiced there. Mm -hmm. And lo and behold, Tepeyac Family Center took off. And then across the country, there were other people setting up centers, Catholic practices, medical practices, pregnancy centers were trying to medicalize. And you begin to build this infrastructure at the most basic level. How do you practice excellent medicine? The way it was done before Roe. Mm -hmm. Before the word medicine was abused. Or politicized. Without a doubt. And so for 30 plus years now, five doctors, two midwives. For the first 15 years, we were a for-profit practice. For the next 15 years, we were not for profit. Because, you know, medicine is shuddering. The world's shuddering. Economy's shuddering. Politics is shuddering. Now it's getting worse and worse, and people are beginning to get polarized. And then they... So, yes, uh, back in 2010, I used to work alongside Students for Life, talking at medical schools. Mm. We went to 60 medical schools. A former abortionist talks about, how do you keep abortion rare? Mm. That title, you know, 200, 300 people, you know, 85% of them are mushy middle. They're there for pizza. <laughs> the other 15%, 13% are pro-choice, pro-abortion. 2% are pro-life. That's the numbers. And so I learned to speak to students. And they were coming into the practice now to learn. So we were mentoring them. And then there were practices popping up across the country. <clears throat> doing all facets of Catholic medicine. Either they were free clinics, like some dioceses were putting up. Sometimes they were pregnancy centers that were trying to medicalize a little bit. Sometimes they were natural fertility, fertility awareness centers using the NAPRO technology method to build a medical practice. And then we began, as we began to talk more, both inside and outside the medical schools, they began to matriculate through the system. Mm -hmm. And now we see great Christian Catholic men and women at some of the best programs in the country in maternal fetal medicine, mm. in oncology, praise in endocrine, praise God. Yeah, yeah. So on the practical end, we have a medical practice where we've gone not for profit. We believe that that friction where iron sharpens iron, you know, you, I've heard you talk about the three goods of man, the external, the, the internal and then the soul of, of, of the body, the soul, and then the external, the three goods. And those ideas of um, being obedient at the soul level and being pure at the body level, but also having that poverty of spirit at the external level. That's what I think we've done at Tepeyac OBGYN, where we found a way to see the underserved right alongside the served. We've seen a way to bring in all the different methods of fertility awareness. Mm -hmm. In all, you know, there's certain words that sound really good, which everyone would like to have. For example, forgiveness, um, salvation. We like these words, but a prerequisite to being forgiven yes. is to be a wrong. <laughs> which we don't like. In order to be saved, you have to be desperate and incompetent. We don't like that. So the hurdle that our Blessed Mother helped you jump over to just acknowledge, because I've said it before, but I mean, whenever we sin and we're ashamed of the sin that we've engaged in, especially if it's a grave sin, we have two options, right? We can say, I've done something evil and I was wrong and I need mercy. That's a lot more difficult, especially when on the other end, you've got everyone shouting at you saying, no, no, you're good. Shout it from the rooftops. Celebrate your abortion. This is good. God wants this. This is, it's the people who are against abortion. They're the ones who don't want babies killed. They're the evil ones. Way easier in a way, in a way. Uh, but as you say, the body keeps the score. 
way easier to go down that path. So have you encountered or helped other abortionists? <laughs> and, 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 yeah. Yes. Yes, we have. Um, abortionist is a word that I use uh, very um, specifically for anyone who has participated mm. or referred in their training or in their practice for abortion. So let's get back to, so you're spot on here, Matt, in regards to um, I'm wrong. Medicine teaches you not to say that ever. Mm. Oh no, don't, don't do it. It's not healthy. It's not good. It's not financially helpful especially in the world of reproductive health where the lie is abortion, the death of the fetus, the murdering of a, the child in the womb of its mother and encouraging her to, to desire that is good medicine is healthy for the human person. And so this idea of abortionist, there are, there's a graying of abortionists. The reality is, um, Fifth, 10 years ago, I believe the number was close to under a thousand for the whole country out of 63,000 OBGYNs. And roughly Why? how many abortions are being done a year in America now? Back, well, well, we don't know because nobody's keeping track of the medical abortions, just like they never really kept track of the surgical abortions. It's all been numbers that we have to trust from them. Right. And so I would say 1.2 million, 1.3 million, 1.5 million. And you've got under a thousand. Correct. Why? Because it's violent. When we were doing surgeries, Matt, and this is where it really, uh, once again, the Lord in his mercy um, and his healing are coming to the fore. It is brutal when you do abortion on demand, abortion on demand. That's what. It's not in the first trimester. It's those who do abortion on demand. That means yeah. all three trimesters, and it means for any reason. When you do that, your heart becomes hardened. And it, it shrivels up. It, it's, it's the opposite of fleshy. <laughs> it's the opposite of... Mm -hmm. open mm -hmm. and fertile. It's the opposite of what you read in the Psalms. Lord, give me a clean heart, a contrite heart. None of that. Yeah. And so when there's this graying of the abortion industry, and they know it because that's why they went to medical abortions, because we're losing the skill set needed for the surgical abortions. There's Hello. less I want to say thank you to Hello, which is the best, not just the best Catholic app on the App Store, any App Store. It's the best app out of any app that's ever existed, Catholic or otherwise. I think it's finally time to say that. If you want to grow in your prayer life, please check out hello.com slash Matt. If you sign up on their website at hello.com slash Matt, you can get the entire app for free for 90 days. That's ridiculous. After those 90 days, if you don't agree with me that it's worth the, the money that you're going to get charged after that monthly, which is a relative, relatively small amount, you can just cancel. You won't be charged a cent. They have sleep stories. They have My Catholic Lo-Fi on there. They've just added the Gospels, a dramatized version of the Gospels. They have daily exegesis on mass readings, which you can listen to. It is fantastic. So if you haven't done it already, hello.com slash Matt, sign up over there, try it for free for three months. Lord, give me a clean heart, a contrite heart. None of that. Yeah. And so when there's this graying of the abortion industry, and they know it because that's why they went to medical abortions, because we're losing the skill set needed for the surgical abortions. There's less and less people doing it because even as they recruit members, <laughs> young voices for choices, they leave, they leave because 80% don't. They join the program, whether it's at McGee or, yeah. or San Francisco or Harvard, they can't finish it because of the brutality. It's resonating somewhere inside their psyche, inside their heart. Yeah. 
Now they'll still justify it academically yeah, because yeah. I'm not wrong. Yeah. F you go somewhere. Yeah. And yet it's, you're the problem. So it's a part of us. You know how you says it ripples through the community. Mm. We as doctors, we send people for, you know, many doctors, good doctors. I couldn't figure a way out of this. So we sent this woman for an abortion because the baby was so sick, so disfigured, so suffering. So when I say abortionist, so we have had many folks mm. and uh, I'm, you know, one comes to mind. Uh, <clears throat> I had metastatic cancer early on in my like 95, 96, no 96. And uh, it had metastasized my brain. I needed some chemotherapy. And the only people who helped me because I was by myself on call 24 seven. My wife was my nurse. We had a business manager, but we were, you know, busy. The abortionists, the local abortionists covered me when I had to go into the hospital to get my chemotherapy. They wouldn't take money from me because when they had some challenging cases with hemorrhage after they killed the baby and the mother was dying, I would run into the room to help yeah, got the you. mother. Pre-conversion. Pre-conversion. To be clear to those watching. To, to be, yeah. But also yeah. post-conversion when the mother was dying. Yeah. So the baby's already dead, but the mother has become de You know, there's many medical conditions. So when there's an emergency on labor and delivery, you run towards the emergency. You don't decide what you need to be doing. Mm -hmm. When the alarm goes off, when the emergency, we need anybody now stat to operating room two. You go in, you just help. That's what you do. You get in there and then you realize, oh my God, what is this? I'm pumping blood into a mother who's bleeding out. Mm. They help me. One night while I'm in the hospital getting chemotherapy, one of the doctors is delivering one of my perinatal hospice patients. Mm. This was a Hispanic family that had a core, um, a child inside the womb who had brain damage, heart damage, intestinal mm. damage, kidney damage. This baby wasn't gonna live very long, but I allowed it to spend time with mom inside the womb like a hospice. And when this child was delivered vaginally, they celebrated this birth, but he had to stay an extra two hours. Mm. And he comes knocking on my door in mm. my medical chemo room saying, son of a bitch, you just made me deliver a monster. I'm, this is horrific, Bruchowski. This is medical malpractice. This kid should have been aborted a long ago and they're having a party in the room. Are you kidding me? I am not coming back to help you ever again. Count me out. You know, here's, this is a friend of mine. This is somebody that I'm acquaintance with that I'm trying to work, you know, just to be friends with mm -hmm. because I understand what he's doing on both sides of this issue. Lo and behold, seven years later, he knocks on my door, comes in, brings me a picture of Dubrovnik. He goes, hey, I took, a I took a page out of your divine mercy care and I spent my vacation in Yugoslavia <laughs> identifying bodies in those murderous mm. pits they had during the war. Oh, wow. But I knew you loved Dubrovnik. And I stopped at a place called Medja something. And I think that's where you were. He sits down, he goes, can I sit down? Can you give me five minutes? Sure, Bob. John, do you remember when I burst into your room and I called you all sorts of names? I'm like, yeah, damn right I do remember you. <laughs> darn right I do. And he goes, I was wrong. I was wrong. I'm a good doctor. I wanted to, I wanted to help my patients love their families as much as that family loved this child. And when they passed that kid around, I went, oh my God, mm. this is love. But I couldn't admit it then. I admit it now. Yeah. I want you to know, my friend, for the last seven years, I've been struggling with doing abortions and I'm stopping them. I've stopped them as of 
a month ago. Mm-hmm. Here was this man, because what you do is you disciple people. You live your life. You try to witness it. You engage people at a heart-to-heart level, core odd core. You try to get to know them, see what makes them tick, where they are, and then you befriend them, even though you disagree on some of the most horrific issues there are. Yeah. And then when they ask, <laughs> you talk and you share a single malt or you share a coffee mm-hmm. or you share whatever and you become. And so I have found that in my experience, there have been probably eight or nine OBGYNs in the Northern Virginia, Maryland, Washington, D.C. area that have come out of the slop like I did yeah. just by accompanying them, walking alongside them, showing them that it's not crazy to do, that I'm a good doc and they know it. It's a good practice we have. They, un- they understand mm-hmm. and they see, my God, it works, but more importantly, how happy you are. I, I, I have a... Go for Something it. of a confrontational question Go for you, for and I don't mean any disrespect, but it seems to me that abortionists should be imprisoned. If the laws were changed and that happened, have you ever thought about yourself going to prison? Yes, absolutely. The, re- will- the way that I've approached that idea is that putting, um, how, how do I say this? Um, Abortion is legal in this country. It's an abomination, but it is legal. Mm -hmm. And I can have a conversation with them about the legality and the ethics. But remember, we live in a world now where words and logic mean nothing. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It's experiential. So rather than go hard on them, on who? The abortionists. Mm-hmm. I saw, my, there for the grace of God go I. Yep. How do I help this? In my position as a practicing OBGYN, who now runs a relatively large, but also, you know, it's been around for 30 plus years, a Catholic based Tepiac OBGYN. I have found that the way to change people's hearts on this, because you can no longer do it, very rarely can I do it academically. They have data, I have data, you have your things, I have my things, words don't longer matter. And I can get into squirrel holes where we're just missing each other. But by loving them and listening to them, um, you slowly begin to walk alongside them, not as pariah, not as leper not as murderer but you come alongside them and i can say i understand what you're trying to do yeah but i totally disagree with it i mean and that becomes the pushback where that's where i've seen the sheer number of conversions and changes of heart with people who are true abortionists I have friends in Florida who are only abortionists that have stopped doing abortions. Mm -hmm. But the vast majority of people are people, they're good people. Well, see, I I agree with you. I I see what you're saying. But I think this, and I also believe that mercy is the off ramp to people stuck in any sin. To come up beside somebody who's, uh, let's say, looking at child pornography or molest, any of these abominable things, right? To simply come up and go monster, I'm not obviously that's not helping anyone convert. Correct. And yet they they deserve to be in prison. Correct. So I think the two can be true. Like to want to walk beside people, but at the same time, what imprisonment is is for reform, but it is also for punishment. I think they ought to be in jail. There has to be at some point real deep conversion, and that's when you say outright, "I deserve." To be in jail I uh, this was heinous and when the mercy of Christ touches you and you begin this other life yeah 
that's what I want to offer them. And that's what they see about peace. Mm -hmm. Do I understand it? Hell no. <laughs> I'm just a little old guy that grew up in a Polish house called to do this particular, this is where the Lord has me. This mm -hmm. is my purpose. This is who I am. I'm a child of mm -hmm. the father and I'm trying to get people back because that's where the changes can be made in a world that has gone polarized beyond yeah. belief. And once again, I'm, I've become so saddened by the politics and the challenges that are out there. Mm. Uh, I stick to my lane of medicine. I really want them to come to know the love of Christ mm. and that mercy is not cheap. Yeah. It comes at a, we were bought with a price. And uh, it also comes with a price in this world as well as, uh, you know, in the future. Now, I hadn't heard of your book until you mentioned it. But for those who are watching, yeah. I'd love them to get it. I'm sure, sure you go into much greater detail than we have today. What we have, yes. Uh, Two Patients by Ignatius Press, uh, right. published last November. Uh, it's... Uh, you can pick it up at Ignatius Press. You can pick it up on Amazon. You can also pick it up at johnburchowski.com. Mm -hmm. um, but um, it, it's really just about a change of heart and that it gives moms and dads hope that their children, through intercessory prayer and trust in our Lord and his promises, um, can, be, uh, uh, can, be quite, uh, can be quite fruitful. Um, you know, we hear all these phrases of pray, trust, and don't worry. Yeah. And yet it's so hard to do mm -hmm. because we're constantly in that, in that battle and that, uh, you know, within our own hearts mm -hmm. and yet, uh, the virtues, the sacraments, the intercessory prayer can transform hearts. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're really about with our patients. Um, and we're also teaching now medical students and residents, nursing assistants, nursing pra nurse practitioners, PAs, uh, because they're now being assaulted within their medical educational uh, regimens. And it's becoming harder and harder and harder to get through mm. their, their courses. And so we're meeting them, helping, encouraging them and accompanying them both whether it's the psyche or whether it's the spiritual or whether it's the medical. These are the arguments and that these are the, um, you know, this is the best medicine that you can provide. And by using fertility awareness, you can actually add something to the team of medicine. And mm -hmm. that's been the real gift. We've been helping accompany people through the system. What was your reaction to the overturning of Roe versus Wade? And <laughs> what do you think? will happen in the near future or the not so uh, near future? Sure, sure, sure. Um, I was, it, returning it back to the States um, was something that I couldn't imagine happening. I was in uh, the Woodlands, Texas, north of Houston, and I was at Mass, <laughs> and across the text came the blast. <laughs> and um, there I am, before the Eucharist prayer. Imagine all the people who prayed for me, mm. all those men and women of the 1960s and seventies, all those docs who were silenced because they were life affirming pro-life. Think about all those people who stood out, you know, in front of clinics. Yeah. Uh, our friends who oh the locked. grandmas how many rosaries were prayed how many rosaries were prayed and then to see this return back to the states mm -hmm. and then Dobbs is now the law and now every state Ohio and California you know every state has its own system and now it looks like the high the 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 evil head has just opened up even yeah. worse once again I don't I legalities don't often change hearts. I know they bring people along, God mm -hmm, love it. Mm -hmm. But I'm convinced that there's a new generation of physicians and a new generation of clergy that are standing up. We now have 30 years of better medicine. Mm -hmm. We now have 30 years of John Paul II, mm -hmm. and Benedict and the church 
we have an opportunity here to witness. But the question is, like you often have helped me, uh, Matt, the consecration is really an entrustment. Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah. Let's do this then, because you, you keep uh, we keep well, circling. No. Well, listen, I, but I'm, I'm telling you, but I'm telling you, the entrustment is about holo- it's a holocaust. It's full giving of your total self. Mm-hmm. It's what my mother and father try. It's what my mother and father intended. Yeah. At baptism. Yeah. Baptism and then the consecration. Beautiful. Why? Because it's just building on one another. And yeah. this is what we Polish people do. <laughs> <laughs> make kabasi and, and give everything to our lady and our Lord. But then it, it's a Holocaust. The world today, I'm, I believe, is like Henry VIII's time after he left the Roman Rite and started this, mm-hmm. this own world of his. So... We have to go to the Douay Reims. We have to go outside of England, outside of medicine, or inside of medicine, but somewhere safe, authentic, and not only teach them doctrine, dogma, you also have to teach them language and the nuances of the experiential part, no matter what the cost. I know, just like you said, it's what prompts me when you said, Go to jail. Yes. (laughs) Yes, Matt. That's me. I deserve hell. Me too. I deserve the center hell of Dante. Mm. I need to be frozen in the inner circle of hell. Frozen. Frozen. I need to be just like I did to all those embryos. Are they your children? Are they your property? Do you love them or do you own them? That's how we talk about IVF. It's this. And so you talk about conversion. And when we say, oh, a mari- so me- conversion, whether it's De Montfort or whether it's Colbe, but now it's Gately and all, it's wonderful. <laughs> but it's also you and Pine, you and Father Pine. Mm-hmm. Did you go through that little sprint of a consecration we put together? And I can tell you, it was probably the closest to what I experience as a practicing physician. The points made in that book flow from my life. This is like a joke. This is funny. (laughs) I mean, what? And it's all about the um, full of grace fruit of the womb and Mary. I'm telling you the way that the book was put together in such a Mm. straightforward way. I recommend it highly. Well, thank you for those who are wondering what we're talking about. My father, Gregory Pine and I wrote a book called, (laughs) please look it up. (laughs) Uh, Consecration to Mary with Aquinas. With Aquinas. Yes, that's it. That's good. It's always great when you start forgetting. Oh, here we go. It's right there. Ah, here it is. Marian Consecration with Aquinas, a nine-day path for growing closer to the Mother of God. And so we basically every day there's meditations from yes. Aquinas. And th- this all got kickstarted because I found a beautiful prayer from Aquinas entrusting himself to the Blessed Virgin Mary. Entrustment. Yeah. And it was the language that gets you beyond a lot of the yeah, difficulties. The might have, yeah. And I think that's what we've done. That's what two patients have done for me, my, this book we wrote. Um, we use the language and the intellect to get you beyond some of the hangups. What do you mean you have to have abortion for life of the mother? What do you mean you have to abort sick children? Mm -hmm. What? Well, no, there's ways to talk about that heart to heart, honestly. Yeah. Because moms want to spend time with their sick children. There's ways that you can really collaborate Mm. with your patients and with your peers. Anyway, what I'm saying is, is that that book that I wrote, uh, has gotten me, um, opportunities to speak to Christians, Catholic, you know, outside the Catholic faith, yeah. including. And uh, it's something that we have taken seriously because at Tepiac OBGYN, our medical practice, we see the underserved as a not-for-profit. 30, mm-hmm. 40% of our patients are underserved. Mm-hmm. So Divine Mercy Care helps raise some of that funding 
because this is how we have stayed in business for 30 years, not for anything we've done, because this was not given to me on the Hill. It was how it just organically mm. grew up. Yeah. And then and then on top of it, it's the academic, it's the intellectual side, but it's really the accompaniment. We want to we want to inspire and encourage the consecration. Mm -hmm. So you can understand that Holocaust is at the heart of it. Because today, with all due respect, we are at a place in discourse and in politics and in church and in socioeconomic issues. There's no more conversation. There's only interrogation. Mm -hmm. There's demonization. And the Holocaust piece, even though it's hard to always bring up, you kind of keep it, keep it down until people are ready for it. We're there. And I can tell you that my, that our medical students and our residents and doctors, good doctors across the country are beginning to see this because we're being searched by our professional groups. Mm. You know what I'm, I, this is a search and destroy mission and that's okay because the mm. priests and the religious that left Douay went back to England <laughs> and did what they can do. Mm -hmm. Those wonderful martyrs from Ed Campion on down. Um, I think that's where we're at. So not only do we have to give people uh, the information, we have to give them the courage to say, this is the area we live, this is the time yeah. we live in. And, uh, you know, walk with them along that path. Um, but I'm I, so grateful for yeah, this. I know that what I'm about to say sounds like what you have to say at the end of an interview, and maybe it is that, but I just wanted to thank you for, <laughs> gosh, thank you for allowing yourself to be an instrument within Our Lady's hands. Thank you for coming here. Thank you for sharing your story as difficult as I'm sure it has been. As you say, the Lord has removed your shame as he has all of us, or at least he wishes to. But uh, thank you so much um, for all the work that you and your wife are doing. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. It's been a real uh, delight to be with you. And I pray just abundance upon uh, thank you. pints with Aquinas. Mm. Shall we, pray, shall we finish yes. the Hail Mary? <laughs> yeah, let's do it. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb, Jesus. Holy, Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death, amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, please. Amen. Amen. Thanks. Thank you.